Hello magpies, and welcome to the final part of the history of my Dungeons and Dragons world. At least, the final thus far. Last time, our four noble orphans had discovered their birthright. They found an enemy in the apostate al Hazred. They rose to become rulers of a new kingdom. They lived to see the death of the emperor and the fracturing of the empire. They awoke a goddess and they prevented the return of an ancient evil. Things are certainly heating up. So let's swoop ahead and continue the story. The eruption of the Halruan volcano cast a cloud of dust over the earth, choking out the sun and heralding a year of darkness, where crops failed, where many fell to madness. And all of those old enough to remember the dark times feared for their return. As the new year dawned, however, the clouds opened up, the horrors passed, and in time a new generation emerged that knew none of the hardships of their forebears. Princess Cersei, however, she was troubled. She had meddled in the affairs of the gods, and she had disrupted the balance of nature. She believed that Brenna had performed an ultimate sacrifice to protect the world from the return of the being that was once Lolf. Brenna had suffused her essence into every part of the world, into every grain of dirt and every blade of grass, and into every living thing, at the cost of her own consciousness and her own selfhood. So delicate was this balance that the goddess struck, that her dawning breath had shaken the world and had destroyed the Halruan homeland, plunging the world into darkness. To ensure that Brenna did not stir again, and did not destroy the whole world this time, Cersei outlawed prayers to Brenna, lest the sleeping goddess be disturbed by wayward pleas. Thus, Cersei devoted herself to guiding the new religion in innovative ways, and her principality of Burdusk came to be a hotbed for philosophical inquiry and the appearance and growth of cults that sought to change the world to understand it, or simply to become part of something bigger than themselves. Over the next two decades, the new faith flourished, and the faithful began to speak of encounters with the other six divines, as they seemed to wake into being, one by one. First was the mysterious Vorin, lord of mysteries and of riddles. Then the mournful Marcela, who kept the souls of the dead and who had always existed beneath the sea. The fiery Basaya came next, the twin dragons of nobility and passion. Then the elder Rainier, the lord of nature, and the dark as Rai, the lord of winter and of conquest. And finally, last to awaken, was the righteous Endurus, the lady of justice. The girl Maria, Cersei's childhood friend who had been possessed by Brenna upon the goddess's awakening, she bore an albino child who grew to become the heavenly prince Alban, the head of the new faith, as Cersei retired from public life. 
All the while, tensions mounted between Cormier and the Vale. As heresy overflowed from the upstart kingdom into the imperial capital, the Inquisition cast their eyes westward and debated whether worship of the Seven Divines could precipitate a second spell plague. King Monfort keenly remembered his defeat at the hands of the Wyvernspurs, but to his credit he made no move to exact revenge, despite the calls for invasion by more hawkish members of the nobility. Indeed, the military might of Cormier so dwarfed the tiny sunset veil that tales of the Wyvernspurs ungodly and demonic powers circulated to explain away why this land of heretics had not yet been brought to heel. The year 1471, 100 years after the end of the Goblin Wars and the birth of Azun V, it was a year of terrible happenings and of strange omens. There were three blood moons in the course of a single summer, and stories abounded of strange jellyfish-like tendrils descending from the moon itself to drag victims screaming up into the sky. The dwarves reopened their fortresses and upended the world economy with their flood of riches and the sale of their gunpowder technology. But most disturbing of all, the dro, presumed extinct following the destruction of the Underdark and the retreat of all of the elves, the dro emerged from hiding to wage war upon the surface world. In an orgy of destruction and cruelty, they spread across the Southern Palatinate like a plague. They slaughtered the entire population of the Nation of Arm, competing with one another as to who could collect more skins from their victims for no reward except pride and viciousness. Wherever they conquered, the sky turned dark and eternal night reigned. Their goal as they pushed north into the western heartlands seemed clear. To exterminate humanity and for the worship of the gods to become extinct. In their path lay the ancient library of Candlekeep. Within the old wizard Magnus lay in exile as ancient as the stones. He was now so old that he was unable to move without the aid of the summoned creatures that tended to his every need. Bitterness and willpower alone kept the old man alive intensified by a desire to protect the knowledge of Candlekeep from the ravages of the Dro, He protected the fortified library every day and every night by maintaining a magical barrier around it. And he split his mind into dozens of pieces in order to maintain concentration upon the spell at all times. But a dro assassin managed to breach the barrier and sprung upon the infirm wizard. As a poison dagger sought out his heart, Magnus froze time just to reflect a moment upon his life before finally embracing death. Reaching into the demi-plane where he stored his memories to protect them against senility, he relived the evacuation of Arabelle. 
the kindness of Linchavari, of raising the young emperor like his own son and protecting him through the spell plague, of his time as a conqueror of nations and a destroyer of empires, and of the painful last memories, the last moments of Azun's life that led to his own exile. These memories sparked something hidden deep within the arch wizard that had not seen the light of day in many a year. The light reminded him of hope, ignited the, the flame of his arrogance and kindled the sensations of living that are heightened by adversity and these caused an upstart thought to persist. That he wanted to live. That he was not yet ready to die. The last ruby on his ring of wishes vanished. And in a flash, the wizard was restored to youth once again. The assassin was burned to ashes in a burning green ray erupting from the wizard's finger. And the young Magnus, now retaking his birth name of Simon, rose like a phoenix from the ashes. But he placed one condition upon the wish. To curtail his own temptation to meddle in the affairs of nations once again. That he may never again leave his tower in Candlekeep. Meanwhile, King Raymond de Montfort attended the Council of Shieldmeet, the meeting of all of the Palatinates, called a year earlier than usual to address the Dro threat and to attempt to unify the warring factions of Faerun against a common enemy. It was a difficult meeting, to say the least. least. With Kalimshan and Mulhorand, two of the mightiest nations, they sent diplomats but declined to actually participate in diplomacy undermining Cormirian authority. The representatives of the Western Heartlands were understandably absent, fighting a war at their borders against the Dro. But Azun's nephew, King of Vladimir of Impulter, he openly snubbed the proceedings to continue a war of colonial expansion in his own lands. When Princess Cersei appeared, uninvited, descending out of the sky in the pride of Elysium, it must have seemed as if Montfort had lost control of the council completely. Then, one morning, late in the negotiations, storm clouds gathered overhead and a massive bolt of lightning struck the center of the king's camp. In the smoking crater lay a metal bladed ring, the Sudoshana Chakra, seemingly a gift from the gods. Capitalizing upon this omen, the Archbishop Banao de Mori head of the Inquisition gave an impassioned speech for the nations of the Empire to put aside their petty squabbles and to gather for a mighty armed pilgrimage that harkened back to the glory days of the Emperor Azun. He called for all the righteous and the faithful to put aside their petty wars and come to the aid of their allies in the West and thus to drive the sacrilegious dro from the earth. He promised that all those who gird themselves willfully 
and take up joyous arms in the name of the gods, shall receive a remission from sin. Devolt! The crowds cried, cried together. The gods will it. Yet one voice remained silent. The ancient spymaster, Mendril Bellerod. For his heart filled with treachery. The motivations for his betrayal are unclear. Perhaps following the fate of other half-elves, he had finally succumbed to madness. Perhaps his loyalty to Azun caused him to resent Monfort. Or perhaps his own legacy of trying to maintain and restore the old traditions of, of the world as it was in times before, perhaps this caused him to view this new popular movement as a bridge too far. Who knows, perhaps he was even working beside the Dro in some kind of elvish solidarity pact. Whatever the reason, he turned traitor and summoning spirits of fire, he ignited a mighty forest fire, seeking to burn up the gathering army before they could rally. He was defeated by the fallen elf paladin Elena Aramis, formerly of the Imperial Guard, and thereafter, Bellerod was sent to the most secure, the deepest and darkest cell in the fortress of La Roque de Chevalier. One can only imagine the secrets he still holds after a hundred years as spymaster. This is the nature of my world. In the year 1472 by the calendar of Harptos, as it emerges to the new chapter unfolding. The summer months mark the time between planting and harvest, when the circumstances for war become ideal and the great armed pilgrimage shall march west, led by the heroic Sir Elena Aramis beneath the red banner of the Black Raven. In its path lies the Sunset Vale. And though conflict between these two nations has been avoided thus far, save for an ongoing Cold War of espionage between the Royal Heralds and the Harpers, what will happen now when the greatest army the world has seen in half a century descends upon the Western heartlands. What machinations have the spymaster Bellerod set in motion? Will the revitalized Simon be able to resist meddling in politics and in the fate of nations? There are many more questions, magpies. Many stories kept behind a veil of mystery and many secrets untold in the narrative. Only one thing is for certain. Each campaign, each game in my world will add more to the lore and advance the narrative step by baby step. This is the unbridled magic that is the cooperative storytelling adventure of Dungeons and Dragons. Thank you, Magpies, for letting me share the history of my world with you, with you, and I do wish you all the best in all of your storytelling experiences. That said, there is only one thing left to do, and that is roll for initiative.